learned the techniques, I learned the process of sales. And then as a part of kind of the, some of my experiences, I started to grow real appreciation and curiosity. And then, and then what I did, and this is the most important, I saw how my curiosity and my genuine interest paid off. <laughs> like, it wasn't like, oh, Jake's just getting smarter. Like, no, I'm using that business acumen to, to put together proposals that show I get it better than fucking anybody. Welcome to the Rising Leader Podcast, bringing forth the new wave of rising leadership and helping leaders find purpose, connection, and results. This is your host, founder of Alluvians, Alex Kremer. What is up, y'all? Welcome back to the Rising Leader Podcast. And if this is your first time on the show, we welcome you. We are so grateful for you to be here. I am excited about today's conversation. I've actually been following this guy for uh, six, seven years, something along those lines via LinkedIn and uh, many other ways. He's a very well-known person within the tech sales, leadership, VC, private equity space. Uh, and I'm just excited to get into it th- with him. So uh, Jake Dunlap, what is up, my friend? Good to see you. What is going on, man? I'm looking forward to it. It should be a fun conversation. I love the whole everything you're up to, um, you know, raising the importance of sales leadership and you know, I think a lot of times sales leadership, especially as you're a rising leader and the point of this podcast, you know, you don't get as much love, you don't get as much training and development, etc. And, it's, um, you know, I can talk about my journey later, but I love the whole thing that you're doing, man. So yeah. looking forward to it. Well, there's a lot changing right now uh, <laughs> for, for those way. sales leaders out there. So uh, we'll get into that. But, but first, I'm going to give a little bit of background on you, Jake, and I'll let you fill in the blanks with what I missed. So first off, you're the CEO of Scaled Consulting. Uh, you're helping companies not just scale their revenue processes, but also uh, their operations. Uh, and like I said, I've been watching your your stuff on LinkedIn. You were actually, we well, were talking about this before the show, you were one of the first people to start posting videos on LinkedIn talking about kind of the modern sales approach. Um, so, so you're an innovator uh, in and of itself. Uh, there we go. You were a, a top voice in revenue strategy operations and chat GPT trends on LinkedIn. Uh, and you are also the author of your new book, The Innovative Seller, which I am very excited to be getting into uh, on this call, how AI uh, plus tech is impacting selling, uh, the strategies to maximize outbound sales, the modern sales journey, how scale uh, is impacting your company. And in addition to that, you actually have a master class that goes along with that in, in your community. Yeah. So. We've got a whole, yeah, we've got a whole community we'll get into too that you get for free as a part of it that we built. That's pretty, it's pretty awesome. We've been talking about doing it for a long time, but didn't really have a, you know, I was, I was always nervous to do another, like, oh, that what another community, but I realized like, you know, people don't need another Slack community, but a resource community where they can get really high quality information and like a Reddit or Discord, you can kind of interact with people in that type of format. Um, you know, so if you're a, a seller and leader, you know, wanting to, to get into, you know, what's happening and go deep on a lot of this, we'll put the links, you know, for all yes. that. Yeah, we too. will attach the links in this podcast here. So I want, I want to actually get into that. So the innovative seller, you know, as I have speak, been uh, speaking with sales professionals, sales leaders, every single day, I think there's a very common theme amongst everybody of like, damn, there's a lot going on. <laughs> AI is changing things, you know, how organizations are recruiting people, getting people uh, fulfillment, how you're driving revenue, how outbound is going, what what people are even looking to from their leaders. Um, It's a lot. It's kind of overwhelming. And if you let it, it it kind of hampers you just a tiny bit of like, oh, my God, what am I supposed to do? So I guess give us like a, a high level overview of the innovative seller. We kind of get into it a little bit more as we go into this of. You know, what, what are you teaching? Yeah. What are you preaching through this, this book? <clears throat> yeah. And, and I'll talk about, you know, some of the things you talk, you know, and that, that, that really is a good segue. I mean, for me, why I originally, you know, kind of contracted with Wiley to write a different book. And, you know, as I started to get into it, you know, I really started to think about like, hey, we haven't had a new framework for sales, but both on the leadership side, how you like build at the very big picture, all the way down to like frameworks, you know, for like the the most recent one, like some of the more popular methodologies that you as rising leaders are probably using. My guys, I don't know if you know if you know this, but these things were developed in 1996. 
Medic is literally from Medic is 19. The internet was baby around. Some of you might not have been born, right? Or like maybe maybe you were like in in third grade with the methodology that you're implementing. And so, you know, I didn't want to write another methodology book. And what I realized is sales needed more than just like it's not just the methodology, it's the technology, it's the go-to-market, it's the sales process. And I take that all the way through to the renewal and creating power users. And then uh, how do you always think about optimizing it to try to provide a more workable framework? So whether you're a leader or whether you're a rep, you could, you know, you can read the book and every chapter, it's like, boom, I can go action this, you know, immediately. And then if you're a leader, it's like, okay, there's some steps that I can follow to kind of move there. So for me, it was more of, I love sales. I love I love where sales is going. I think it's going to be exciting. And, um, you know, I think we've got to fix. There's some things that we need to adapt based on buyer behavior. And I, I wish it was as easy as it was. And it was, dude, it was. I can tell you, I've been in sales for 20 years. Like, shit was easier. Like, there really were things called decision makers that would kind of like, if you really could prove ROI, like they would buy and like push things down. And like, that's just not how people buy now. They're buying teams. There's no one decision maker. There's no one economic buyer. There's no one champion. Like you got to get these teams on board because any one of them can say no. You know, so we talk a lot about how do you build customer journeys that also deal with the people that come in. You know, right now we give everyone the same experience. And so, you know, as a leader, let me ask you this. Like if I come in and I've hit up two other leaders I know about your product already, I already got pricing from your competitor because we use something similar. I should not get the same experience as someone who's coming in cold. I should start at step three. So you should have two or three people on that first call, right? And and God forbid, like send an email in advance. Just send an email. Hey, I work with many people. Your first call is coming up. Um, where on the continuum are you between this and this? I want to make sure I show up to the first call prepared. Because that's usually the next question is, Jake, how do I do that? How do I understand if they're educated, right? So we call it vetted, educated, cold, and self-service that everybody has to have a sales journey that can address people that fit one of those. So it's not, it's more complex, but you know, there's not infinite variabilities. You know, it's not like, you know, marketing where like, you know, they can get so hyper targeted on all these like millions of different persona types. There's just a few. So that was it, man. Um, saw the trends that were happening. You know, we work with hundreds of companies every year. We've got 30 plus people on the team. I get a chance to see every at bat revenue organization build you can imagine. And, you know, kind of took a lot of the knowledge of the work that we do, where I see the where I see things headed to put everything into the book. So, you know, that's really where it came about. And, you know, some of the core principles mm -hmm. in it as well, too. I, I want to get in to some of the stuff around uh, commitment to technology around kind of outbound and go to market strategy, all this sort of stuff. But even before we do that, I actually am really curious. You've now been named, you know, a top voice within this world. You work with many private equity and VC backed companies to to be doing this type of work. You have a lot of experience in the sales and the leadership realm at various types of companies. Is this are you just naturally interested in this sort of shit? <laughs> like like is this is something like, yeah, hey, I want to study dude. it. Like, I want to learn it. I want to Yeah, dude, kind of man. Like I mean it's interesting you say that. I think um you know, when sales is done right, it checks a lot of boxes for me. I think like, you know, my, my uh, you know, I won't go like all through my journey. But, you know, um, in college, I did telemarketing. And I was able to be like to make money. And I was able to be better than people because I was able to not care about that. Like when people would, you know, be upset with me, I didn't really get upset. Like, of course, it sucks. You know, I don't want to. But I also like had a pretty thick skin. And you know, I applied that to other places in college too, you know, but like, you know, you, you can take rejection. Um, so, but I, I kind of, I had a little bit of that skill and it is a skill. Like I didn't, I don't think I started with it, but then when I got into sales, um, you know, my very first job, there's a guy, he was you know 28 and he did a, a career change. I was working in professional sports and, you know, he started turning me on to books and I, you know, I'd kind of gotten out of reading in college, but when I was a kid and growing up, I, I liked to read books. And so he would, he would, hey, Jake, you know, here's some sales books, here's some marketing books. So I started reading and da da da. And like, and as I really got to like what the essence of sales is, it's helping people with their business. And it's fun. It is fun. It is, it is still, I probably in a year, I don't know how many, I still run 
hundreds, if not a thousands. I mean, it's definitely in the hundreds of sales meetings every year. Probably still to this day. Um, I'm good. Like I still enjoy it and get in the mix because, you know, one, I, I just enjoy learning about people's business, right? So like I have that, that, that naturally curious mindset. And as later in my career, I learned more of like the process of sales and the techniques. Sales checks a lot of boxes mm. for me mentally, you know, to be curious about someone's industry. Like what the hell does industrial manufacturing do versus this tech company versus a pest control? Like, you know, like it, it, when you really dig deep and I'm like, tell me more about that. Like, and, and you have that genuine not like I'm trying to qualify someone mindset. Now, like at the end of the call, it's like, hey, is this a fit for us or not? Right? Maybe it is, maybe it's not. Um, so that was it, dude. And I think for me, when it's done right, again, I think if you're somebody who's naturally curious, you can be a little, you're okay with a little bit of discomfort. Those are all things like that pushes me to get better every day. Like I'm, I'm comfortable mm -hmm. with discomfort. And so that's a skill set as a CEO now that's helped me to become a, you know, a, a much better and better CEO over the last, you know, 10 plus years too. And, you know, we've got 30 something people now and, you know, growing and you know, having a great start to this year. Um, and, you know, that ability to get discomfort, uh, not be comfortable to, to analyze how I'm doing, you know, and my performance without passing judgment on myself. Those are all skills of if you've got that growth mindset. I think a lot of people could be good at sales or, or, you know, be into sales, but, and it applies to a lot of other parts of life, even for a lot of you, if you want to go do other things too, like that ability to push yourself to be better um, and be okay with discomfort mm -hmm. and not judge yourself. I think that's it's a really valuable sales lesson. So that's a you know, <laughs> long answer to a short question, but yeah, it just checks a lot of boxes for yeah. me mentally. It's just stimulating, you know, like sales is one of those. Uh, it's a mirror for how, Am I doing? I love what you said of like, am I getting comfortable in the discomfort? Am I willing to push my my boundaries? Be like, ooh, this is edgy right here. W one follow-up question to that though is, do you feel like you are passionate and enjoy learning about the craft of, of sales and like influencing or enrolling people from a good place? You know, not not trying to like screw them, but or, yeah, yeah. or are you really interested in the art of, business of like, man, how do you operate? Like, cause there's, there are kind of two sides right there of how do I talk and relate to somebody? And also how do I just understand their business and actually bring a curiosity to that? Yeah, it's both, it's both, man. It's a really good question. I started off more on the technique side. So, you know, I started off again with these, like learning, like, okay, slowing down when to use a pause when did like, so the technique side is, are some of the things that I learned at first, I would say, um, you know, I'm not, you know, there's a difference. And, and again, like I was, you know, as a really successful sales person and leader and, you know, moved up very quickly, um, because I was, you know, performing and, and growing into new roles. Um, I didn't learn this. I didn't learn the process and science of sales until, you know, probably four or five years into my sales career, where I had a company that kind of taught me the process of like, no, this is how you run a discovery. This is how you run a demo. This is how you do follow up, and and when I was able to apply my techniques there, but follow, but learning the system, mm. I exploded, you know, and that's where my career skyrocketed, and um, and I think that's where I I kind of found the passion for the business acumen side of it, of like the because again I worked at a company um, in the career space, and um, we had ter so the team I ran, um, we were we were by territory. Right. So, you know, we were talking to, like I said, like an aerospace bit. We, we had my team, I ran the Pacific Northwest group um, out of Phoenix, the Phoenix office. And so we travel and market too. But man, I mean, we were going to meeting with, you know, the largest mini storage company to an aerospace company to a tech company. So I had to get versed in all of this. And it is wild. I never thought about it when I was learning all these different industries. And dude, we didn't have chat GPT where I could say, hey, what are the top three trends in aerospace right now, which would, would have been sick. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think it was kind of that migration. It's like I learned the techniques, I learned the process of sales. And then as a part of kind of the, some of my experiences, I started to grow real appreciation and curiosity. And then, and then what I did, and this is the most important, I saw how my curiosity and my genuine interest paid totally. off. <laughs> like, it wasn't like, 
oh, Jake's just getting smarter. Like, no, I'm using that business acumen to, to put together proposals that show I get it better mm-hmm. than fucking anybody. And, and, and then I could train my teams obsessively on what our buyer percentage did, cared about. And over time, I could speak really intelligently, like why not deep about a lot of different industries. And so that, you know, as I you know, started a consulting firm, I could quickly get it. Like even if you're a software company, oh, you sell the HR, I got you. Oh, you sell the finance, I know this. And so I, I think if you're always investing in yourself as a leader, as a rep, you're, you're preparing yourself for your next, next step, whether you know it or not. And I think I'm, I'm always, I don't know where this knowledge is going to pay off and I don't like to waste my time. But, you know, I think that was kind of mine. Technique, process, and then the acumen side, I think is where I started to kind of put, and I think it was those three together that made me a really great seller yeah. and leader. I you mean, know, you've both. been doing scaled for about 12 years now. And just hearing as you kind of reflect on that journey, scaled is simply... It's like, how could you not do scaled if this is like what you are naturally interested in? You've been trying to, you've been studying that. That's, that's kind of, I never thought I'd be an entrepreneur. I never, I never, ever, ever, ever thought I would start a company. It was after being a multiple time VP of sales. And like, you know, it's funny you kind of call that out. And I also started to realize after this, I'm like, I'm also not very good at politics. Like I, I was young, like I'm a VP of sales running a 40 person team at like 31 or something like that. Like, dude, I didn't, and I didn't do a good job of getting mentors and other things too. So, you know, as you get in these rocket ship environments, um, you know, there's a lot of things to see around. And then I realized I'm like, what is this my job, dude? And, and again, like, I don't want to discourage any leaders out there, but I do want you to be purposeful about your life and your career, which is, I looked at my life and I said, okay, this is the role. You're going to go be a VP every two to four years. You're going to get fired because they want the older guy. You know, they want the older guy who scaled to a hundred and then like, oh, you scaled to 60. It doesn't matter if you were more effective and more efficient. I just was able to look at my like career ahead. And I went to my wife. I'm like, why would I go do this again Mm. for somebody else? Why would, like, I didn't, again, like I, I, accidentally started a company and I knew I was too young to want to start a lifestyle business, right? This is, you know, 10 plus years ago there, you know, people weren't doing side hustles like they are now. And I, I not, again, I'm just too driven to want to do that too. Um, so, I, you know, I was just, I've always been very introspective about where I'm strong, where I'm weak and the things that I mm. need to do to improve um, and not relying on a company to have to tell me what those things are. It's great when they do. But, that, you know, your career development, my professional development is my job. It is my life. It is not somebody else's to do to me. If I get it, you know, I get professional development amazing, but that's not mm-hmm. going to stop my growth. And you, it's just, it's powerful to witness the incredible impact you've been able to have because you've gone on that journey. And, you know, you work with companies like Microsoft, Splunk, you work with organizations like the NFL, the NBA, you know, it's, it's cool even looking at the scaled consulting website, by the way, it's an incredible website. I like sent it to one of my website developers. I was like, we have to figure out. how to upload our <laughs> cool, man. But it was just really cool to see like, Hey, you know, we have a plan. track and we work with organizations between that five to 50 million point. And then also from that 50 to 500 and then that 500 plus. And there's, there's such different, um, not just if you're in a different industry, but different stages of it. And you have an ex- expertise, you bring a methodology to it. And I want to, kind of get into that methodology just a tiny bit here. You know, in, uh, you know, your book, The Innovative Seller, one of the things you talk about is a commitment to technology and AI proficiency, especially in regards to sales. And I think there's this feeling of like, oh, AI is so great. And also on the other side, people are like, oh God, I got to figure out this AI thing because everybody else is doing it. And I don't, it's a behemoth of a thing. Yeah. When you say a commitment, like that word really stood out to me. How do you think about That's right, man. that that process there for co- for companies and people? Well, well, one, I love that you called that out and I'm glad we're talking about it because it really is a commit like generative AI is not a sales tool. It is a tool that can be used for sales. Um it is a it is a shift in the way that we solve problems. And the same way and again, a lot of you don't remember a world before Google search. Like, I, I want you guys to think about this. Before Google search, you, there, you had encyclopedias at your house 
you had to go to a library. We're talking 20 years ago, right? 20, 20, I mean, obviously Google search has been around. Let's call it 25 years ago. Let's say you know, mid to late 90s. You solve problems by going to the library. I want you to think about that. Then Google came about. You said, oh, now I get access to information via search. Search uses broken English to come up with something, etc. Now we have generative AI. It is that monumental of a shift in the way that we problem solve. And so that is what step one, the way that we problem solve has forever changed. You can choose to either invest and change your behaviors or don't. And again, I'm 43. I've been in the game for a minute. As soon as you know, me and Kevin Dorsey, we sat down. I've told the story a few times. We were talking, we were having beers and pizza at Pint House Pizza here in Austin. And we started talking about chat GPT. I've been messing with it. This was about a year ago, maybe, maybe not quite a year ago. And he's like, but dude, Jake, if it can do this, it can do this. And I was like, well, shit, if it can do that, it can do this. And if it can do that. And then we both realized like all of the knowledge that we have amassed and we think is proprietary is not because chat GPT is like 80% as good as me. In like a lot of scenarios and in like in, in other scenarios, it's like far better. And sure, some it's worse. And the knowledge I have is proprietary around certain things. Um, and look, I've always had this understanding that, you know, part of sales is understanding the technology, right? So, so there's chat GPT and there's also your sales te tech stack. Look, if you're a rep or a leader out there and your team is using outreach every day or Salesforce, get certified. Like, I'm just like, it is, it is mind blowing to me how we think, again, this goes back to professional development. It's kind of funny. We're tying this stuff together. My friends, you're part of sales mm. now is technology. So if you want to be a professional, if you want to be a leader, you can't just sit there and be like, oh, I hope my IT team teaches me how to build a Salesforce report. Go build a fucking Salesforce report. Like, if you want to know how to use one of these tools, go figure it out. Like your team is using this every day. Can you imagine how much better your team would be if you as their leader knew what the tool did? And, and what happened is a lot of sales leaders, Alex, they outsource their knowledge of sales technology to other people. And those people also have only implemented these tools one time, right? As a part of this or two times or three times or whatever it is, et cetera. And so we don't even know how to build teams different than throw bodies at it. And so we, we have to have a little bit of a day of reckoning that we are not going to scale teams by throwing bodies at it like we did in the early 2000s and 2010s. We're going to have to learn how to be productive. And the only way to be more productive is to harness technology to augment the people, right? And so that's why I have that in there of like, and I talk about a principle in there, 80, 15, 5, which is kind of my time, time management framework. I am taking new demos of new software weekly. Just a little, little test here. When Kevin and I had that meeting, I fired myself as CEO for three days. I go, guys, I need to just go play with ChatGPT. Because, and then that's where the rabbit hole started. And now here I am, sure, I sound proficient about it, but it's been a journey, man. It's been you know nine to 10 months that I've been like, you know, tripping on ChatGPT, basically, just like learning what's possible and like expanding my mind of these insane use cases. Um, and so that's why it's in the book that like, look, part of modern selling and innovative selling is mastery of the technologies you use every day. And it doesn't mean you need to be an admin and know how to do everything, but you need to know what these tools are capable of. And you need to realize that they are evolving quickly. So the reason that you bought one tool three months ago, that tool mm. can now do four things. And are you implementing all of it? Most companies we see are implementing probably 15 to 30% mm. of their tools. And because they're using them for very singular use cases. So so that's why it's in the book and why I get so, you know, fired up about it is like the, the potential is there, but sales leaders have to realize they need to learn this because if you don't, the per another person's going to do it. They're going to be able to do 10 times more activity, be 80% as good as you, but because they're 10 times more effective than you, mm -hmm. you will lose. And so these tools is just, you, you can't afford to outsource your knowledge to your sales ops team or hope you're going to get a training. Do it yourself. What are you waiting for? The phrase that you used of, let's just throw bo a body at it, it really resonates. And, I, you know, obviously I was a sales leader and, you know, as I am, am building my own company, I'm like, well, we got to hire a person to be able to do that. Well, I'll just bring on a specialist who knows how to do that. Yeah, and it's exactly. like, it's partially, it's like, well, I have so much other shit that I'm doing. I don't have time. And also it's like, that just sounds like a behemoth of a topic for me to figure out. And there's a, maybe you call it laziness. Maybe you call it fear, I, whatever it is, but it's like, 
let's just bring somebody else. But what you're speaking to is like, it's actually it's here. your job as yeah. a sales leader or a sales professional is like, that's actually part of your job now. You have to learn that. Correct. Yeah. And that's where 80, 15, five is like, it's your job to be spending, you know, 15% of your time. If you, you know, what I talk about is, look, if you want to stay on the hamster wheel of being stressed every month or every quarter, keep not investing in the mid to long term. Keep doing it. Just keep going and investing in deal coaching and blah, 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 blah. You need to be spending 15% of your time on things that are going to impact your business or your team in six months or a little bit more. And 5% of your time on things that might impact your team 12 months to 24 mm. months from now. You have to. And again, I, the good part is these are things that I was doing naturally. I had always been doing this. I'm always thinking about, okay, I remember the first team I inherited. I'm like, all right, strong player, strong player. Okay, I'm going to have to do this. There was another team I knew I could pull from. So I started nurturing their reps. Boom, boom, boom. Three months. Now I bring this team in. By the end of the year, we were the number one team out of 24 uh, inside mid-market teams. In the first year, second year, same thing. Because I'm, I'm not, I'm trying to fix tomorrow. Part, I'm spending part of my time every day and every week fixing mm. tomorrow's problems. And so... I, I, I call it take, and now I call it like taking care of future Jake. So it's like, it's like when you put a glass of water by your nightstand after a long night out, you know, like you got to be doing small things every day to put yourselves in a position as leaders to win tomorrow, or you're never going to get off the hamster wheel. You're always going to be putting out fires if you don't dedicate that time. Um, and you're doing it for yourself. You're not doing it for your boss. You're not doing it for anybody else. You're doing it for yourself, for you to get better and to make mm -hmm. your stress go down. I'd leave at five or six. I'd be good when I was a leader because I was doing it. I was putting in the work. I was disciplined, doing the activities, the small things every day, mostly focused on the now, mostly, but doing those mm. things for the future too. The way I received that, it's like, you kind of saw the field a little bit more. Like you, you picked your head up a little bit. You're like, okay, I see multiple things happening here, multiple just different in things that can impact the situation. How do I start to play the longer term strategy there and so uh yeah and again i'm not you, you don't need to spend very much yeah. of your time there that's the other part right but you do have to spend yeah. some time there so one of the other things that you you know talk a lot about in your book you talk a lot about um even on on your website on linkedin all that sort of stuff is outbound and go to market strategy and Outbound is one of those things right now that, especially in the past two years or so, has seems like a dumpster fire where SDRs are yeah. getting laid off. Is the SDR role even an important role anymore? Is you know the classic statement of is cold calling dead? You know, data providers are shit. You know, AI is creating all this noise within the market, so it's getting harder to stand out. When you are advising all these organizations around what to do when it comes to outbound, what to do when it comes to your go-to-market strategy, what to do when it comes to linking sales and marketing. How do you think about that? What's the best way to, to approach that? That's a big topic, man. Uh, and I know, yeah, that's the, you, you know, you kind of, you mentioned some of the things in the book. So there's four C's, right? The first you mentioned was the uh, commitment um, to technology and AI proficiency. The second is current go-to-market. I'll try to, I'll try to simplify it. And in the book, I talk about this. The, the very first thing, and I actually start with the last thing. I say, if you want to have a current strategy, your sales and marketing teams need to have mm. the same incentives. Like I'm telling you, we've went into companies. If marketing is consistently being like, but this is an MQL. And sales is like, we got to close deals. And not everybody's focused on the yeah. same thing. It's very hard to get alignment. Because if the, if the people at the top aren't aligned, how are you going to expect your, your, your teams to be aligned? So I, I talk about that and that's, you know, and if you're a rep and you're like, Jake, I can't do anything or a leader, you can start to do little pieces of that. Go set up a meeting with marketing. Hey, what's working for you guys? Here's what's working for us. Can you guys go double down on this? Hey, I really need this. Can you like, again, I was just a pushy leader. So I, I went and got, I went and made shit happen, which again, as I became a VP, wasn't the best skill at the time. I needed, I needed to corner some edges uh, or to round some edges. I had corners, um, but you know, you think about how you can create better alignment between your marketing and sales team by just as a salesperson walking across the aisle and saying, you know, finding out who can help you. Um, but at, at the company level, uh, yeah, you've got to think about the alignment. The, 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 the other big piece I'll bring up is really what, what you're calling out, Alex, is something happened in the last probably four years in particular. You know, really 
starting 2016, 17, 18, you know, we started to be able to see some success with pretty email heavy sequences. So, you know, these sales engagement platforms were new, right? So they didn't, like 2015, 16 is when these tools were coming out. And so, you know, you weren't seeing salespeople mass sending a lot of emails. Instead, just imagine what were predictable revenue, which is what still a lot of people use to predict, which says no, X number of activities equals X number of meetings. X number of activities in 2006 and to 2010, when that data was compiled, okay, to say activities is this, every activity a rep did was high quality by default because they didn't have the ability to go hit. Sure, they could do a mail merge, but most reps weren't doing that. And so what happened is activities being the leading indicator started to break when activity types became high quality and low quality mingled together in the same data set. And so we continue to say, well, hey, it used to work when we would do more because when we did more, it was always more high quality activity. If I went to my team as a manager, hey guys, we need to do 10% more. They had to customize that 10%. It wasn't hit send all and then more activity goes out. So that's where a lot of this mindset, just to mm. do a little history lesson, that's why we're at where we're at today is like, we have to go back a little bit and realize, and again, I'll, I'll give the analogy that I give a lot, which is... Um, Tesla has humans on, the, on the, the production floor. Scalable does not mean automated. And too many sales leaders have got in their mind that uh, everything needs to be automated versus it needs to be really scalable. And now what these tools were meant to do in the chat GPT, it can scale really good outreach with a human in the loop to do the quality assurance. Dude, your iPhone, any product that you buy, you know, and, and I don't know why we think in sales we can automate outbound. You cannot do it. Like, I don't give a shit what any of these companies say that are like, we're doing blah, blah, blah. Show me one enterprise company with 100 reps that's using your Gen AI disk profile BS to generate meetings at scale. Yeah, you might be doing it here or there for some small companies because you can't automate this now. Now, there could be a future where some of this can be automated and the way Gen AI is going. But you got to build scalable systems with humans in the loop. Mm. That's the, the, the long long and short of it. And it's really e actually very easy to do, but you just have to arm mm. them with the right things. Scalable does not mean automated. That stuck out big time. You need that human in the loop for that quality insurance. And I think there's a lot of people who are just looking for that easy button, right? I wish, I wish I would tell you if I thought, if I knew the magic email template that you could send all and scale your business to 50, 100, to a half, I would tell you it, but it doesn't exist. Instead, I can tell you, here's some frameworks that work. And you know what still works? Knowing people's personas and business and what they care about and what trends are in their mm. industry. That still works because nobody's doing it. It's pathetic. The, the bar is actually really low. Honestly, Alex, if you just say like, hey, look, man, I know other VPs of ops and industrial manufacturing are going through ABC. Here's how I help ABC. That easy. Hmm. IGBT is good at that. So let me ask you this. And I actually have a feeling about how you might go about answering this question. The role of the SDR. I think there's a lot of controversial subjects here. I know of a very big time, well-known tech company who just laid off their entire SDR team and is even going to be outsourcing some of them to Mexico. Um, there's some who are going full cycle AEs where you, having, you have to build your own pipeline and close your own pipeline. Right. There's some who are actually doubling down yeah. on SDRs and are simply going to uh, an auto dialer so that they're making 500 calls a day because email is not working. What's your perspective in the SDR world? Is it changing? Is the role changing? Do you still do it? Do you not do it? What are your thoughts there? I mean, that's it's it's hard because so much of this matters about how you execute it, right? Like bad execution on any strategy is not going to lead to very much. Um, you know, with any of these things. So a, a couple, I guess, like maybe talking points that I might think about, you know, for somebody, one, AE's prospecting is always a good idea. They need to, you know, be tighter to some of this. I think, I think we're seeing more companies. Um, every company should have AEs generating 20 plus percent of their pipeline. Like it's just a win-win. It just, it, it keeps them close to the value prop, what's working. It keeps them tied to maybe their mid or larger account. So the AE prospecting is 
I mean, that's again, goes back to like, that's what everybody did. Like literally 20 years, like 15 years ago. Like, so it's not that crazy. I think if you have an SDR team, and you think the best go to market strategy is to do a little bit more of the account, I call, it, I call it the account coverage mindset, where it's more about how do we get coverage on more accounts versus like, hey, SDR, here's your book of, of 400 accounts. Your job is to get a meeting with these, with 10 of these accounts every month. You need to know the account. You need to understand the industry. You need to be able to reach out to them. If you don't have that mindset, instead, it's like, hey, we just want to get coverage, just more, more activity. That that's if you're in an SDR role like that, you're not going to be employed for long. Like that's that that's that's what people will get rid of because it's not working. The, the spray account coverage mindset versus owned book and like, look, Jake, you need to go to get to know this business. You you go get a meeting with this group, and we're going to train you how to do that. It's the other part you got to train people. Um, yeah, that's the big. Mm. That's that's it, man. I, that's that's similar. It, I, the word that stuck out is whatever your strategy is, you just got to execute on it. <laughs> it's like you can have them or you cannot have them. It's just like, what, are you executing on what your strategy actually looks like? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. yeah. And, 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 and are you training your team to know the industry stuff and that, or how to get, you don't even need to train them to know it with chat GPT. You can just train them how to do the prompts. I literally, I think, you know, go back to Wednesday or, you know, what's today, Wednesday, the 20th. Go back to my post on Wednesday the twentieth at one thirty. I give a prompt. There's a prompt that I put in there that is like, just go copy and paste it, and then tell me how what it spits out compared to what mm -hmm. your SDR team's spitting out. So, like, that's what I'm talking about about augmenting, right? Like, we just need to train the teams how to augment. Okay, great. We've got this eight step sequence. We're looking behind the scenes on the steps. We're, we've got some email templates where we know like a framework of this type of email works, and now the human goes quality. You know, like that's all mm -hmm. we're talking about here. It's it's really not like a massive overhaul. It's just like appreciating that we have to train the teams on the persona. We have to train the teams on the sub industries, you know, maybe case studies on different industries and what you work with, um, but mm -hmm. not send all, you know, that that's the strategy that's. I will working. say it, you have two really cool downloadable um, pieces of content on your scaled website, one of which is custom GPTs for sales. And one of them is. Uh, AI sales prompts. Um, so just oh, for yeah. anybody listening to this, if you're saying, okay, how do I actually... We'll give you <laughs> yeah. the links. Yeah, go go check those out. Yeah, if you want to cheat and get ahead, we've got now a subscription product. It's, I think, 50 or 75 bucks a month where we've got custom GPTs we've built for like meeting analyzer. Dude, I'm telling you, dude, my next video, I cannot wait. We're doing our chat GPT meeting analyzer Ooh. versus Gong. And dude, chat GPT's AI, dude, chat GPT, like everybody's AI is here. Uh, generative AI is, is here. Like I, it, it's like so much different and better. And, you know, like it, there's just a lot of things that, yeah, you can just push buttons and get ahead when you start to really understand what generative AI can do. But again, you know, or if you just want to push buttons, which is what we're trying to make it easier for people to do on chat GPT. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah, it should be good. Uh, all right. I'm going to quick pause here. Just. Kevin, for who's editing this, um, there's a couple of routes we could go with this because there's we got ten ish or so minutes left for this this pod. Um, I could either take it down the uh, the sales process client journey perspective, which I, I think is a part of your the next part of that book. I could take it towards kind of like what leadership needs to be doing here. I could also take it down whatever might light you up the most or make you feel passionate. So, do you have a perspective there and and how you want to this next part? Uh, I think we could just touch briefly on the optimization or like cust uh, uh, what do you call it customized okay. uh, sales journey, and then um, yeah we can talk about the optimization piece. If there's what I mean is if there's anything that you've pulled out, we can go deep on. But if not, I can we can just go there and spend more time probably on the consistent. I've got I've got something good um, for us. I guess I'm good for us. Okay, cool, cool. So I uh, used to work at a company called Catalyst. So it's a customer success platform. And one of the key things that we talked about at Catalyst was the client journey. Um, and even when I worked at Outreach, one of the key things that we talked about was our sales process, right? And you can actually differentiate your organization, you as the sales professional, you as your product, based on how are you guiding people through their evaluation and also how are you guiding people to get the most out of your product and what we used to call having continual moments of impact 
once they sign. From the moment they sign, there's continual like, wow, wow, wow. So the moment when it's time to renew, not only is it a, well, hell yeah, but it's a, we want more of it. And you talk about sales process and optimization a lot yeah, within man. you know your content within your book as well. So I'd love for you to kind of touch on on the sales process and the optimizing it. I mean, dude, you kind of hit it on the head, man. Candidly, already, dude, like that mindset, like in the book, per, per, like uh, specifically, the customer journey stops at power usage and renewal. Customers don't give a shit about a signed contract; they care about usage and impact. And so if, you're, if your organization isn't thinking that, the process isn't like that, even if the salesperson's not involved, but you're thinking like that, and you're, you're not going to win because they, you know, you're not going to talk about it. People are so tired of the implementation over promise and all that stuff, right? Um, so really, Customized Sales Journey, Third C, just talks about, again, I, I mentioned this up front, but vetted, educated, cold, self-service. One, McKinsey's putting out crazy stats. People, people right now want to self-service between 50 and 100,000. And when talk like I already I've talked to three of my like friends who use your product. I I used it five companies ago. Or I use your biggest competitor. I, just let's just start, you know, like and so. But again, but other people definitely want to talk to people. So like we just need to have just slightly more complex. When someone comes in and is really excited and have done all the research, where should they start? Well, there should probably be like three people from your team on that first call because what's the CS process like? Let's let's go. If they're cold, cool. You're already doing that. Right. So it's just this idea. We just need to be a little bit more dynamic. And then the other big piece I'll talk about is just we need to have we need to realize. Um, and again, there's a framework in the book. Uh, I don't think we'll have time to get into it today called intent. But the T stand, the first T stands for teams that the idea of one decision maker and over focusing on one person or one economic buyer or champion is not how people buy. They buy in teams today. There's an end user team. And they have to believe and be sold that there's value and impact to go through the implementation. It's going to help their team use it. And there's another team that cares about the business impact and ROI. And there's overlap in those teams, maybe some people that straddle those two. And they could be at different levels of education. You did your first three calls with this team, and now they loop in the business team for the first time. You need to go back and treat them like cold. It's like d deals are just not linear. There are these teams that buy today. And so if you're, if you're a sales manager and you're like, all right, great, who's on the buying team? Who's going to be involved in that room? Well, it's going to be these people. Because in today, the lowest person on the totem pole in that room will shoot your deal down. Nobody makes decisions. Every decision, most decisions, I should say every, most decisions are made by consensus today. Sure, there's a final, um, maybe like, but, but anybody can be the naysayer or anyone can be, it'd be the ad, like anyone can be a champion. It's like, they all need to be doing those things. I need to treat everybody because Nancy's got the loudest voice and has been there for eight years and she doesn't fit any of those, but she's the biggest pain in the butt for this deal. She's not the champion, the economic buyer, the decision maker. Nancy loves ABC.io, you know, and she's on the usage team. So how are we getting the usage teams through it? So it's really not that, again, like why I developed, I didn't want to do like a whole methodology, but it was like, we have got to upgrade just how we think about deal review and, you know, customized journeys is a way to do that. You know, just, again, it's not infinite variables, just a few things. Where are the teams in the process and where are they coming in and how do we treat it? That's it, right? It's really not that overly complex. There's not 800 mm -hmm. permutations of this. There's a I have a, one of my very good buddies. He just moved into uh, an enterprise AE sales role. And one of the things he talked about was um, I used to think that enterprise AE role was the same as mid-market or SMB. It's just like, you're selling bigger deals. And he's like, and now, he said it's because of his manager who has a lot of experience there, he's like, now I'm actually realizing that there is a massive difference because speaking to exactly what you said, if we aren't looping in the IT team well ahead of time, if we aren't discussing Correct. implementation to occur at a very specific window of time, like it's, he's like, there's about a month and a half to two month window of time right at the very beginning of the new year where we can do it. If we miss that, we're going to have to wait a whole nother year. And so many other factors of like actually gaining consensus. It's like you can get the power users and the leaders of those power users be like, man, this is awesome. Like we want to do this. And it's still not to actually happen. And you ask yourself, like, well, I, I don't get it. They want it. The value is there. The ROI is there. They have a massive pain point. Why is it not working? It's because, man, there's about three or four other key players in the organization 
that are needing to bring this whole cohesive strategy together. And I think that's exactly what you're speaking to there. That's it, man. And I'll just I'll just call it out to double down on your point. Like the second in is is you know I thought about like needs and pains and all this, which it can be like subjective. The reality is numerical. It's, it stands for numerical priority, which is for the user team. This could be numerical priority too. So instead of asking them, oh great, like hey, tell me what you know whatever the questions are, like great, where does this what we're talking about fit numerical priority over the next two quarters, Jake? This is top priority. Your rep hears that. Oh my God, this is priority number two. But guess what? For that impact and ROI team, it's priority eight. So you've got the user team that said, yes, this is priority two. And the other team that said eight, mm. that's a problem. And so that's why, again, we just have to recognize there are, and again, this happens in smaller deals, man. Like everybody uses team buying now. It's not even, you know, I'm not even talking about big enterprise. Like there is that one or two people on this team or one or two people on this team, even in a $30,000 mm. sale. So yeah, man. So Jake, I just, uh, I have one more question for you, but before I, I give it uh, to you, man, I just want to, I just want to acknowledge you, man. Like, first off, you are a wealth of information, which is awesome. I already knew that was going to be the case. But one thing that I've really enjoyed just from listening to you is you got, you got passion, brother. Like, like you're excited about what <laughs> I, I, lo- I love. <laughs> I this mean, it stuff, comes man. through, you're excited about it. And I'm feel myself becoming more excited about it based on your excitement. And I think that just to like acknowledge you is that's a differentiator. Not everybody has that. And I think when you talk about the mission you guys are doing, the, the reason why you guys are impacting so many companies, the reason why your book is, um, which is going to launch, which we'll talk about here in a second, you know, soon it's just like, that, that's why this stuff's happening because of the passion that you're bringing and because of this innate curiosity and genuine hunger to learn it yourself. Um, it comes through, man. So just, just, just thanks for bringing that energy here. Oh, yeah. Appreciate you, man. Thank you. My last question is this. This show is called the Rising Leader Podcast. And this is a question I ask everybody as the final one. What do you view as the rising leader? I mean, I think we've covered hopefully <laughs> some of those points, right? Which is, um, you know, the investing in yourself is probably the one point of if you want to be a, and again, most of you don't want to just rise, you want to rise quickly. And you're not going to get the experience and training you need on the job. You need to give up all hope. You need to put in the work and treat this as a profession. And so the number one piece of advice that I can give is, what is your next, next step? Where do you want to be? Not necessarily in your next role. What does that person look like? If you close your eyes and visualize it, and what are you doing small things today to prepare yourself for an opportunity Mm. when it comes up? Because you don't just get magically picked to be a VP or a CRO or CEO. You do small things throughout and then opportunity comes up and either you've got that qualification and skill and you're ready to be plugged in or you Mm. don't. And so to me, to be a rising leader, and again, there's all the things I talked about, about what you need to do to stay up to speed on technology, what you need to do to make your teams more modern. But when it all at the end of the day, it comes down to you and your journey. And are you investing in yourself and not sitting around, well, why is my well, we don't have a leadership development program. So go build, go do chat GPT, build me a 10-week leadership development program using content from here's Jake Dunlap's, you know, uh, LinkedIn, here's his YouTube, blah, blah. Build me an eight-week Jake Dunlap link leadership training program. Like it, this, these are all like there's very that was a pretty bad prompt, but you can do a version of that. So, but but you get my point, man. It's like you have to like why I rose so quickly is I had I did have a leadership development program, which is great, but I didn't sit around on my laurels. Mm. I went and made it happen. You know, I went and got the education. I, I worked on the things. I was honest with myself about what I wasn't doing well and, and oh, yeah. worked on those things. Strong answer right there. So Jake, actual final question. People are probably listening to like, all right, I got to check out his book. I want to check out Scale. I want what, What's the best way to get the book, to follow you, all that sort of good stuff? Yeah, man. We'll definitely come. I mean, we'll put a link there. When you buy the book, you also, I mean, it's literally 40 bucks. You get the masterclass, you get access to the community for a year. There's a uh, innovative seller summit um, where we had like a crazy, crazy lineup um, as well. So you get that people are in there cha- chatting, sharing their experiences. So just go do that. It's 40 bucks. Like I promise you're going to get the value. I'll ref- I'm happy to refund you if you, you hate it. Um, but you got the teaser. So like, I mean, you kind of know what you're getting yourself into. Um, and then LinkedIn, go follow me on LinkedIn, just forward slash Jake Dunlap, um, put out posts on sales every day, basically. Um, and, you know, 
Uh, those are probably the two best places. Uh, we'll put the links in the show notes. You can go to jakedunlap.com or I think you can just go to innovativesellerbook.com uh, as well too. But if not, we'll put some links in here for y'all yeah. to check out. Awesome. Well, Jake, thank you so much, my friend. And for all those who joined us, once again, thank you for being here. And I guarantee there is somebody that you were thinking of that you're like, man, they got to hear this episode. And so I encourage you to share this with them, spread the good word. Uh, word. And with that, uh, Mr. Jake Dunlap, thank you again, my friend. Thank you. Appreciate it, man. That's fun. Thanks for listening to the Rising Leader Podcast. Make sure you hit that follow button so you get notified every time a new episode releases. If you know someone who wants to take their lives and their career to the next level, send them this episode so we can all rise together. For more information, check out alluvians.co. We'll see you next time. And in the meantime, keep letting it flow.